friends, my name's Mia Park, and I am here with my Tai Chi teacher, Patrick Kelly. So this is the second interview that uh, we've been able to do here at his annual uh, Tai Chi seminar in Switzerland. So Patrick, thanks for joining me again for another interview. You're welcome, Mia. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, <laughs> too. So I wanted to start out with some questions about the philosophy mm -hmm. and about the practice itself. Can you explain what Tao is or Taoism? Right. Well, first of all, um, our byline was always Tai Chi, Taoist principles and practice. Right. Um, that is, that's, that's what we've always used in the past. I have to say now, um, 40 years later, from creating that byline, I think of it as a more universal teaching. So in that sense, I would think of the Tao as the universal path. It's a Chinese name for um, the path, but the path is, of course, universal. It's not a Chinese path. It's a Chinese name. So the, the concept of Tao is really um, maybe better than the path is the way, because it's not just the path that you have to walk on. It's the way that you need to proceed. It's more than, the, more than a path that you tread on. It's the actual whole way. It's the whole method of what's required. So that's, that's really what the, the Tao means. It's the method of walking the path. Can you explain, like, maybe what makes the path that we're on universal? Like, how, how, why is our Tai Chi practice a universal path as opposed to a different Tai Chi practice? Right, well, as you know, I had three major teachings, teachers. And one was my Chinese teacher, taught the Tai Chi as a Taoist principles and practice. One was my Sufi Gnostic teacher. And um, so he, he taught the, the old Gnostic teachings, which is a, what the Sufis use. And um, the other one was the, the Indian yogi. And so originally the Tai Chi I taught uh, as the Tai Chi itself. And so the Taoist principles and practice was perhaps the relevant byline. But now the, the Tai Chi teaching, the teaching that came from these old Gnostic Sufi practices and the teaching that came later from my um, Indian yogi, these are all really combined into one. And that's really why I would call it a, a universal path. I mean, if you research back in the history of the last 8,000 years, then you find that these teachings came out of the out of Mesopotamia, out of the Euphrates Valley. That's where they began. They began the, with the old Zoroastrian tradition. And they spread from there over thousands of years. Um, in those days, the, the large civilizations arose around the, uh, the big river valleys because that's where they could cultivate crops and so on. So the, the Nile River Valley was one of the um, first places that the civili this, this teaching spread to, where civilization grew after the Euphrates Valley, spread to the Nile Valley, it spread to the Indus Valley and down into India. It spread to the Ye Yellow River Valley and into China. So that those were the three big growths of civilization. Over those first 5,000 years, we can say, from 8,000 years ago. So up to about 3,000 years ago. So it's really one universal teaching mm. that branched out over the last 8,000 years into three major branches. And from the Egyptian one, it spread into Greece, the Gnostic teaching, back through the Sufis and into Western Europe. The Indian one is clear that it went down into India, the Buddhism and spread into Southeast Asia. And the Chinese one, the Taoism, which also became mixed in with the Buddhism, a slightly different variation of the Buddhism, the Chan Buddhism, and spread into Japan and so on. So there were, there were really these these three teachings that I learned from um, really have one source. And I think the deeper you go into any teaching, the more you go back to the one source. And that's why I'd call it a universal teaching now. Do you think it was a coincidence in your 
tra trajectory as a student that you happened to meet three really good teachers from the different branches of the this one teaching? Um, as my as my Chinese teacher said when I said I was I said once I feel really lucky that I meet him met him and he said there's no luck in these things mm. it's a fate so everything I've learned in the last um, approximately 50 years of doing these things um, those three teachers I was fated to meet there's not the slightest doubt about it and so I think this is an age where civilization where people now move freely across the earth and through the TV and every other uh, electronic media you know what's going on on other parts of the earth and it's not like a thousand years ago where you knew your village maybe a little bit more the occasional um, very adventurous person would travel out for a year or two and come back mm -hmm. but most people knew a very um, something that was associated with their culture not much more now it's now there's now there's a, a type of universal sense of all people on the earth you can know what's going on all places on the earth and I, and I think what's needed from the esoteric point of view is not any longer esoteric teachings that are embedded in a particular culture but the esoteric teaching that is free from those outer cultures and is more universal and so that's what I believe in that's what I do I think I've asked you this before. I believe that the reason why you're using the medium of Tai Chi as the physical mm -hmm. access point to these teachings right. is because that's what you happen to have discovered first as opposed to like doing yoga asana or um, like the Sufis do this kind of spinning ritual. Is that correct? Or like why do we do these Tai Chi poses? So I think as a, as a physical basis for the, the physical side of the, the physical etheric really um, side of esoteric teaching that Tai Chi was a is a very very highly refined um, practice so from the the something like the spinning of the Sufis that, that was a very small branch of the Sufis it's not their major practice um, different Sufi branches have some physical training um, but it's not a highly refined, uh, deeply embedded thing. And even yoga, you know, the Hatha yoga has mostly developed in the last hundred years. Yes, as a yoga teacher, yeah. I'm very well aware, yeah. It's um, my, my Indian teacher who practiced the Raja yoga. And the, the amount of Hatha yoga they did was very small. It's just a few basic postures to um, maintain the body in some reasonable state for the much more internal things that they did. And whereas Tai Chi has quite a, a, a well-developed and extensive um, history of people, of good teachers, going back hundreds of years, we don't know how long, you know, back prehistory, of good teachers slowly refining and developing the physical practices as a basis of the um, internal training so partially yes I met it that's the one I met partially I was fated to meet it and I do know that my last life was in China so it's it's natural perhaps that I met this um, but also I've continued it uh, you know I have done other things as well for example I, I learnt Chinese yoga which I haven't heard of Kai Men, it was called, from a very good Chinese teacher, and it was very similar to uh, Indian yoga, except that the movements never stopped. They moved into the postures and out of the postures in a continuous movement. And every posture had two stages, one stage and then an extension. So it was, I could talk more about it, but I spent quite some time learning that one as well. It was called by that teacher Chi Su, it was called Kai Men, which means open the gate, open the gates of the body. So it was specific practice, specific physical practices, sort of like Tai Chi in yoga postures. That's to say the smooth movement, the concentration and so on, designed to 
stimulate the energies in the body and bring them up through the, the centers. So you just mentioned how Tai Chi is, one of its intention is to move energy through the body in a specific way. Right. So um, there's a common understanding that Tai Chi is like fast martial arts slowed down, right. or Tai Chi Chuan, which is the martial art, I guess, form right. of Tai Chi. So how do we connect doing a fast martial art pose and slowing that down into developing internally and being like a more developed human being? Right, I, I can speak about two sides of that. F first of all, the fast and the slow. There are fast movements in Tai Chi and they're slow. There are fast exercises and there are slow exercises. And they, they each have a different purpose. When you move fast, it's more natural. When you move slow, there's a better chance of studying the, um, the, the series of steps that take place in the body. So when you want to analyze it and perhaps modify it, slow is better. And when you need it to become natural, then we speed it up. So slow is not, slow is just a, a, a useful method. It's not the thing itself. Tai Chi is not slow. Tai Chi is natural. And so when we need to move fast, we move fast. Um, it, it's the method of investigating the thing that we slow it down to have a look at it. But then we replace it back into a, a fast thing. You know, the Tai Chi form, the short form takes as we train it here, maybe 15 minutes in the long form, 25. But when I train them, for the long form, I take about 12 minutes. And if you try it at 12 minutes, you'll see you're moving quite fast. So, so slow is not a, a principle of Tai Chi. It's just a part of the earlier method. That's the first thing, the, the slow and the fast. And the second thing is, um, that the, the motive of training sets where the results will go. So if you train anything as a purely physical art, if you train it for your health, the results will go for your health. There will be no spiritual development. If you train it for martial arts, the results will go to the martial art body and it won't go to your deep inner self. So the motive sets the um, the where the results um, end up. So the true motive of Tai Chi is a should is like the true motive of yoga. It's for your internal development. But these quickly become uh, distorted in, in life. So lots of yoga or Tai Chi teachers are teaching it as a career. If you teach it as a career, all it will do is bring you money you can forget about the internal growth. If you teach it for your health, you teach some people, you be more healthy, and all that will get you is some health, and you can forget about the internal growth. So it's very important, the motive that's behind it. Tai Chi, and that's why, that's why I, I buy, put this by, by word, Tai Chi Taoist principles and practice, so that anybody who came to my Tai Chi this set the motive. It's the Taoist principles and practice. We're practicing something that's part of the path, the way of internal development. We're not practicing something um, with the motive of health or the motive of self-defense, but these are useful side effects. When you train Tai Chi with the right motive, you will also receive the health benefits. And you will also receive not martial arts in the sense of the ability to fight, but a a better ability to defend yourself in all physical, emotional, mental situations. So I'm wondering where the access point is from our physical Tai Chi practices towards becoming a spiritual practice. Besides, I mean, is it just having the motive? Okay. Um, the, mo the motive sets, it sets the um, the mood, you might say, it sets the, the purpose in the beginning. And all spiritual practices, what they involve is this consciousness that's um, sent out into the external world, the normal life. You need to turn it back on yourself. That's, that's the process. 
So when you turn it back on yourself, if you only turn this mental awareness back on yourself, you just get this quiet mental state where you might see your thoughts, you can feel your body a little bit, you can go get deeper into that, you can feel like you accept everything, you see everything as it is. That's not a real step deeper. That's turning an outer awareness back onto, the, onto yourself. So the first real step deeper is when you turn the mind deeply inside yourself, you start to become aware of the body from the inside, from the inside. And as, as we know, the, the, simple, the simple thing to do is instead of focusing through the five external senses, um, we focus through the internal senses. So we know that inside the body there are special senses in the joints, in the muscles. There are pressure senses, there are heat senses, there are pain senses. So there are, there are five main groups of senses inside the body that tell us what's going on inside the body. And the outer mind is not usually listening to those. It's listening to what you see, listening in, in a metaphorical sense. It's um, aware of what you see, it's aware of what you hear and so on. And so I attempt to turn that part of the mind back inside is, is, um, fails. It just brings a quiet awareness state. It brings the, a type of you know, mindfulness, the modern mindfulness that's taught for money and gain, that, that won't lead to good spiritual development. So you have to turn the mind not only back, back inside, you have to turn it inside in such a way that that part of the mind that usually looks outwards um, is, is um, put in the background. And a deeper part of the mind um, begins to listen inside the body to the sensations that the, that the body's intelligence is looking, to, looking for, is already listening for. So you turn the mind back inside and you listen for the sensations that the body's intelligence is already listening to. So the first step is really to move your, merge your consciousness with the body's intelligence. So that's the step. And then when you go deeper, you'll find the body's energy field. And then it's to merge your consciousness with the intelligence that's managing your body's energy field. And then deeper than this, you'll find a, a deeper layer of the energy. We call it the deep emotional, the astral, if you like. And there's an intelligence, your own intelligence on this deep level, to merge this consciousness in, into the deep, emo, deep emotional level associated with the middle dantian and much later, something associated with the upper dantian. Mm -hmm. So there, there is an internal path of turning the mind back inside, and it begins with merging with the body's intelligence, and that's where the external practice of the Tai Chi comes in. And because the external Tai Chi practice is so refined, that's right. it puts pressure on us to mm -hmm. go inwards more and to connect with that intelligence, right. and also, um, it's just a long practice. It's a yeah. lot of, it's, there's like the refinement is endless. So yeah. the practice has a lot of potential to go deeper. Right. So whatever a person can do, we give them something that's more refined. So they have to find something a little deeper than what they've got at that moment. So what can students expect to get out of practicing Tai Chi? Like what kind of success can they mark their change by? I mean, because our, because our motive is clearly for internal development, that, that's really the, um, the progress on that is the gauge of their success. But they can also expect to get um, the, the, the bodily effects, a good bodily effect. So one of the immediate, fast and obvious body, body effects is, is you learn to relax your body and become very loose. The, bo the body becomes very loose and free rather than the tightness that often accompanies people even who do a lot of exercise. So the, that looseness of the body is something, um, it's a, sp a speciality of good Tai Chi, I would say. So that, and that in itself gives a type of, um, that, that it's in itself will lead to good health. A lot of the aches and the pains will go away. Uh, the, the blood can, lymphatic fluids, the energy circulates much more freely and usually the and so the health of the body will become stronger. That's more or less like a side effect, but obviously a very good and useful one. 
the ability to withstand um, pressure from other people is something that, that also develops. Because we, we use pressure in the training, we use uh, training not just to concentrate deeply or, and listen in the body and um, be relaxed when there's no pressure on, but to do these things while there's pressure on. And then we increase the pressure so people are able to maintain the, the good state of the mind, the body, the energy under pressure. That's really the, um, one of the big parts of the training. And that carries directly into your life that under the pressures of life, you're able to maintain the good centralized state. So these, these are the things apart from the, the internal growth that takes place because of the main purpose. I've personally seen that in my own life, mm. you know, practicing this way. And I guess that also answers how Tai Chi can help a person emotionally and mentally because obviously physically, as you said, one of the unique specialties mm. of Tai Chi is that it creates this kind of elect elasticity or can help um, with the body in a special way. So Patrick, for someone who wants to start a Tai Chi practice, what can they expect? They can expect to be taught exercises that will first relax them and then, then exercises that will coordinate the body. They can expect to be taught how to listen into the body, to connect the mind into the body. Uh, they can expect um, to be taught exercises that will increase the energy in the body. They can expect to be taught um, how to how to relate with through physical movement, through physical contact with another person. How to relate in the sense of uh, learning to merge with another person's movement, um, respond to the movement softly, sensitively. Um, yielding when needed, following when needed. So the, that physical interaction, it's really a physical emotional interaction because you can't avoid, once you approach this closely to a person and start touching, there's a strong emotional um, thing that begins. So the, although it's seen as this, like a physical practice, there's behind it, there's, a, there's a, quite a strong uh, emotional connection between the two people that form that you have to learn to manage as well. So those are the things you would expect to meet. And um, different styles may use slightly different exercises for these ones, but that's, that's what you'd expect to meet. Being a, you know, a five or six year student, which is a very new student in Patrick's lineage, uh, I'm experiencing that already, the expectations. One thing that I have also experienced that I wasn't sure if I expected or not was the challenge. I mean, this is a really difficult path. This is a very um, physically, emotionally, and mentally challenging practice to be in. And you've got some students that have been around for decades. So clearly, uh, there's something about the teaching, there's something about the system that attracts us to it. So that being said, um, for someone who is a student, an existing student, is there any message that you want to generally give to all of your students now on maybe how we can in, improve our practice or, or um, yeah, how we can maybe reach our intentions in the practice? Well, the, the, the root, of, root of good practice is definitely the motive. So I think you, you need to remember your purpose. R remember it often. Not, not just get lost in the practice itself, but you need to remember why, why you've chosen to practice and, and what, you hope to, what you hope to arrive at from it, if you like. So that's, a, that's in a sense the motive that's behind it. If you don't remember the motive, the motive may in fact slide off into something different just due to um, the events of life and how you're practicing. So you have to remind yourself of the purpose. You have to, you have to remember why why you're here, really. You know, the purpose of Tai Chi is the purpose of life. It's why we're here on the earth. We're, we're here to evolve. And it's, it's worth reminding yourself of that one and not getting lost just in the, the everyday um, repetition. Um, 
So I would say that's the almost the most important thing. You've got to remember why we're here. That's very helpful. Um, especially because there's so much to refine in the practice. Mm -hmm. I think it's really easy to get kind of very focused on these small adjustments and these internal small improvements right. as opposed to looking back and remembering the big picture of why we're doing this. Right, you have to keep the overview, and, but you have to concentrate on the details. So unfortunately, you have, you have to manage those two things. You can't get lost in one or the other. The overview without the details is of no use. So you train the details. We, we make the training difficult because it's the, it's the difficulty of life on Earth that gives people a chance to evolve. If, if you came here and it was a paradise, um, no effort would be drawn out of the people and little result would happen. It's, it's paradise enough when you go out of the body, assuming you've done something for yourself. We, we're placed here in a, a very difficult situation. You can see what life is like at the moment. And the pressure of that causes people to either make a big effort to evolve or they give up and get lost in life and that's another path. So the, um, I can say the, the evolution or the internal development is really an evolution of um, your deep intelligence, your deep being intelligence. Being intelligence is a better word than consciousness. Consciousness is a type of awareness that arises out of the being, the intelligent being. Um, awareness and the ability to act, that's, that's how the intelligent being learns. So your intelligent being expresses itself through the outer physical world, through the etheric world associated with the lower dantian, through the astral world associated with the middle dantian, and through the deep mental world, the celestial world, the heavenly world associated with the upper dantian. So your being intelligence expresses itself through each of those levels and that's what needs to grow. And it grows through um, its evolving awareness and ability to act. As it becomes aware and it acts, it learns. That, that learning in becomes understanding. It's drawn back into the intelligence on each of the levels. So it, it, needs, it needs pressure and effort to cause the intelligence to grow. Without the pressure and the effort, the intelligence won't evolve. It's like a baby, if you just wrapped it up in cloths and it couldn't move and you took away all the external stimuli, one or two years later it will have learnt very little. You place it in the most stimulating um, environment you possibly can and it tries to climb up things and it tries to do things, it tries to do things it can't do. It wants to run, it wants to climb on the you know, cat's back. Um, and one year later, its intelligence will have increased tremendously. So it needs to be challenged. Do you think that there's uh, seemingly extra pressure on humanity and the world right now because it's an opportunity for us to grow? I'm talking about the health pandemic, yeah. um, global warming, politics. Um, I think it's like this, the year's 2021, right? <laughs> the last 70 years, I'm 71 years old. Uh, the last 71 years, since about 1950, life in the Western world has been very, very easy, relatively speaking. You take the 70 years before that, you know, back through the Second World War, the First World War, the Depression, the pandemics back then were much worse. Um, these people will live through a much tougher time. We've had it really easy. And I think humanity has become a little soft as a result. You look, we're here in Switzerland, and the, the, the Swiss have such an easy life that I see them become soft as a result. Then I look at the Russians, I meet some Russians, and they've had quite a hard life. And they're a little bit tougher and a bit more um, power. I'm speaking very generally now, right? Because <laughs> actually some Swiss are really great. <laughs> so the last 70 years have been a little soft, have been a little easy for us. And so this seems hard, what's going on at the moment. But to my parents, they lived through the Second World War, the Great Depression. You know, my parents had, had 
people killed around them. They killed people. It's, uh, a father was wounded. Th this would be nothing. So that's to put it in perspective, first of all. But secondly, yes, the, the, world is a, the world is a reflection of the level of evolution of humanity. So the, the human society is a reflection of the level of evolution. And the level of evolution is not especially high, of general, general population. And so it, um, it, it's a chaotic, somewhat brutal, somewhat ruthless place. But we come into that knowing that, and that pressure to find your way through it gives the opportunity of accelerated um, evolution, which you don't have once you're out of the body and back in a peaceful place. Accelerated evolution. Do, do you think that's really possible for all of us? I see things. I see people being really divisive now because of the pressures. Um, yes, but that's just how we're experiencing this, this, this moment in time. Uh, I mean, in the Second World War, it, it was divisive as, as well. You know? There were two whole groups of people just madly killing each other. Uh, it's, it's a smaller variation of that at the moment. There's, there's a lot of division, you're right. The, the basic division in humanity is the people who have some connection to their higher self, and the people who deny it. So the people who say there is nothing but the physical body. So these people form one group. And the people who say, no, we're here to evolve, is another group. And of course, there's some people who fall in between who are making their decisions. But these are two essential groups that are diametrically opposed in their inner motive for doing things. And that's what we're seeing right at this moment. But we've seen it, of course, back through history. Wow, that's a really great perspective on things. It's not politics. It's not vaccine or not vaccine. It's mm -hmm. is there a spiritual reality to our mm -hmm. existence or not? Of course, that's because that that is the reason we are here. And if you deny it, then you fall into a, a completely different group than the people who accept it and attempt to make something worthwhile out of it. So about students who are practicing or want to practice, I wonder if there's a, a concern for like a regression. Like if you start to develop yourself to a point and either go down a weird path or you just stop practicing, are you worse off or are you, are you better off having gotten to that point at least? Well, the theoretically, all, all of these possibilities are there. That there is a there is a path, and and you can you, it's a wide path. In a sense, and you can wander off a little, and you go on a side path for a while, and, and you learn something. And you, as long as you come back on the main path, you proceed. It's like you know, there's genuinely a path through the jungle, and you're walking on it. And sometimes you go off. But you don't want to go, go off and get lost and start curving off into a far distant land. Um, otherwise, that you could be lost completely. So you can get lost completely, and it's possible to fall back. These are possibilities, but they're not the normal condition. And um, the safety factor is, it's absolutely advised. You find somebody who knows that path, yeah, and you take their advice. And even with that, you'll sometimes spend a little time on the side paths, and that's not too important. To, to spend a little time here and a little time there, you stop and have a picnic and then you go on and so on. Um, <laughs> that, that, won't, that won't affect it. Um, you just don't want to get completely lost. But if you have, a, if you have a somebody who knows the path and you follow their advice as best you can, you won't get completely lost. And to fall back um, is possible, but you need to, um, you need to really um, go, you need to really go against what you're being taught. So it, it's, it's quite common to wander off, you sort of like misinterpret a little what you're taught. You add some of your own ideas and you end up over here and you can come back. 
it's that's acceptable. But to fall back, you have to absolutely turn against what you've been taught. So that's quite a big thing. It's quite a deliberate thing, and it doesn't happen so often. Mostly people proceed forward. Sometimes they rest. Sometimes they wander off a bit. But they generally proceed forward, and very seldom somebody who's already chosen to go on the path do they turn back you might say and fall back that's a that's a rare event and um, as i said to do it you you need to really turn against the things you've been taught hmm. it's not okay. just it's not just something that will happen without you realizing it i guess also maybe intention and motive has a lot to do with you being on the path right that like you said if your motives are pure and you've got good guidance right. then you wander off of the maybe right okay it, there's the scene guidance that's the, the physical teacher that you have and it's absolutely recommended you have one it's a very dangerous thing to try the path without it um, even, even the thought that you're on your own and you can do it is a is not a not a truthful thought actually you're 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 completely embedded in the humanity around you and you're not just by yourself so it's a dangerous thing to, th to think you can do it by yourself or even want to do it by yourself. You have to wonder at the motive. But beside that, there is, a, there is an unseen help that's being given. And, and you attract that help um, according to your motive. First, according to your motive. So if you, have a, if you have a pure motive, you will be helped. There's no question about it. But you can only be helped um, to the degree that you're making an effort. So um, it's really your effort can be assisted and guided. If you only make a small effort, you can only be assisted and guided to a small degree. But if the motive's pure, you will still be assisted and guided. If your motive's pure and you make a big effort, you'll be assisted and guided to a greater degree. That's just the, the natural way that the assistance comes. That's very encouraging. <laughs> so along that line, if something bad happens to you and you feel like you're not getting support, is that because of something you did, like your motive wasn't pure for a bit? I know this sounds like retributive justice and I don't think the universe works that way. But I wonder sometimes if people have pure motives and then you know, their car gets stolen or something, some accident happens. Well, actually people have mixed motives. Nobody, nobody has a one motive. People are, people are multiple multiple, not quite personalities, but multiple um, levels of being. You can have a motive from the deep emotional or a different one from the deep body level and a different one from the superficial mind. So people have a mixed motives. Those mixed motives are all combined to like the general motive. So nobody has a super pure motive. They have a, um, but if it's majority pure then of course it's all mixed but majority pure then you you'll be okay so sometimes the 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 more more or less pure parts of the motive are asserting themselves and at that time it, it may cause a little um well all it really does is it re it blocks the help that's available and then you're on your own and the world is a ruthless part place. If you're on your own, it's a dangerous place. It's like putting a child in the jungle and leaving them on their own. You know? If they go away from the, the leader who has the, the um, devices to survive in the jungle, um, it's a dangerous thing to do. So um, it, that could happen. But things like your car stolen, uh, sometimes this is completely unrelated to, it's just a, it's just the accidental events of life. There are accidental events. And then there's the group karma of the whole world. So some things are happening because of the general condition of humanity. And you're part of humanity, you get involved, you can't escape it. Mm. You can't escape the group karma. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there's the accident. And then there's sometimes what you think is a negative thing will happen, but actually it's for a purpose. Sometimes people need a shock, need waking up, need a, um, something to pull them out of their complacency. So sometimes it has, 
it, it seems like a bad thing, but it may in fact be a good thing. And a good example is uh, a disease that can bring a person close to death. It's very, very common that these bring about a change in the person's life when they just escape death at the last moment. It can bring a complete change in the person's life and a redirection and a, a realization of why they're here, where they were completely lost before. So negative events can sometimes, the only way that a person can be shocked back on the path. So there's a big range and it's difficult, the car gets stolen, it could be any one of these. Mm. I'm encouraged to be reminded that it's complex. Right. It's not just one pure motive or, you know, you lied so you have to pay extra taxes to the government. Exactly. You know, something that's not quite that retributive way. Right. And speaking of interesting events happening, um, so going back to thinking about students hmm. and how s the practice can help a variety of students, right. I know that you've got a senior student who became deaf while being your student. And there's one of your senior students who had a stroke while being your student. And they both still very successfully practice. And I've actually learned from practicing with these students. So what is it about Tai Chi and the practice that can help someone who has uh, physical challenges or that goes through a big major life incident like that? Well, well those, two, those two people, I know who you're talking about, of course, were able to turn that event. One of, one of them, he was just going about his life and suddenly he went completely deaf unexpectedly, unknown why, completely deaf, and he's never heard anything since. And he was able to, to use that, in a, to take it in a very positive manner. And uh, not being able to hear means he has, um, he's learned to compensate for it. And the, that compensation took a lot of effort. And that compensation has brought him benefits, I can say. So he's managed to turn it. So if I speak more, more specifically, for example, if I'm showing something in the Tai Chi, because he can't hear, he watches more closely and he sees things that the others don't see. And that's more important than what I was just saying. So that it's like I, when I learned from my teacher, Huang Sengxian, um, when I first learned from him, I couldn't speak Chinese and he couldn't speak English. And he said, it's like a, a, a dumb person speaking to a deaf one. He, he can't tell me anything and I can't hear anything. But he said, well, he said, still, um, I see and remember more of what he's doing than many of his students who speak his language. Because the, the same thing, so that was as if I was dumb, um, deaf. Um, I had to look very, very closely and I watched the smallest things and I took in everything I could to compensate for it. And that took me a lot more effort, but it gave me a bigger result. And the same for the person who's had the stroke here. That, that was a really big stroke. No, he's, and he is partially paralyzed yes. now. Mm -hmm. And he, he makes a tremendous effort not to let it interfere with his normal life. For example, he, he comes here, he comes on a long journey um, he, you could say his immune system is somewhat, um, somewhat compromised because of what caused the stroke was actually a problem with the immune system. He doesn't, he doesn't care. He's not scared. He's not scared of coming here and mixing with these people. And I've got extremely healthy, much younger students who are scared to come. And he won't allow it to stop him to come. So he makes a tremendous effort to overcome the disability and as a result um, his, his, uh, the result of it is that he receives more. In, inside himself he receives more. A tremendous effort. Um, so in, in these cases uh, they have turned a, what would seem like a very bad event, if you like, to many people. They've turned it into something positive for themselves, and it really works for them. So I think those students are very inspirational, not only individually, 
But I think that they're so passionate about this practice that we have. Um, it's, a, it's a real testimony to the actual practice itself. So I'd like to ask you some questions about you. Right. OK. Sure. Um, so in our last interview, you said that you were completely normal. And I made a joke <laughs> saying that, uh, that we knew differently. And I think that you are a very developed human being on the earth. And we talk about people who are that way. So what is life like for you, having been working so hard on your internal development and being maybe, you know, being more internally involved than people? Well, I mean, I've been working on myself for 50 years. That's almost exactly 50 years. And, and the, the progress is somewhat slow and incremental, although there's little jumps from time to time, which are quite pleasant when you experience them after the slow thing. So it's not like, um, it's not like a sudden change. Um, so it still feels like me, yeah, just an incremental um, change. Of course, I see some people going through life and not really changing. All that's happening is the body gets older and they, then they become senile and ha have a little trouble in surviving in life. So that's the first thing in terms of myself. It feels very normal. Um, I also have, because I've had good contact with at least those three and a few more of highly developed people, then I, I always had uh, a, um, I always had an understanding of, I saw from a distance what it was to be a somewhat developed person. So I had some pictures of it, some understanding of it, and feeling myself moving towards that. And I have to say, my old teachers, when they died, were more evolved than I am at this present. They, they were highly evolved people. Of course, I'm struggling towards their position. So, uh, it's really difficult to say, I suppose. I, like, hmm. you know, there's a rumor that you can read people's minds. Well, I like to say that everybody can read everybody else's minds. That when you have a thought, it goes out on the etheric level. And if it's directed towards a person or in any way involving them, they will receive it, but they're not aware of it. So the, your thoughts get transmitted from person to person. If you direct it towards them or if you're thinking about them, or perhaps if you're even close to them, they're picking them up. So you don't have private thoughts. That's the thing. And then, and then a, if you've learned to become more deeply aware of the, the levels inside yourself, you may be able to become aware of those thoughts that you're already picking up inside yourself. So um, it, it's, I would say it's one of the universal small side powers that's not really of any use in itself that you do start to become aware of more often um, the thoughts that other people are having, which you're already picking up. And you normally, it's just like background noise that you wouldn't even bother to try to pick it up. If someone directs it at you more strongly, then um, you can become aware of it. That, that's, that's correct. So, so, yes, it's true. So... Beyond that, um, are there any challenges or successes to being highly developed in the world where most people aren't? Well, what happens when you, when you develop yourself is your world expands. It expands inwardly. So the physical world becomes only a part of the, as you grow on the, etheric world, it, that becomes a part of the physical world. And the physical world is smaller than the etheric world. And then as you go in a deep emotional level, you, that becomes a part of your world in which you live. And the physical world becomes an even smaller part. So it's half an answer to the question that you asked before, that um, 
that's what happens is that you're partially living in the inner world and your perception of life is the inner world and of course you see some people completely lost in the outer world so you see them going about their life lost in the outer world not realizing that simultaneously these multiple levels of world are existing and then knowing that there are worlds beyond what so I know that there are worlds beyond the worlds that I'm confident in living in and my old teachers and the teachers beyond them and the beings that we might know beyond them are living in worlds that are so more sublime than um, we can conceive so uh, that's that's just how it, how it feels that's how it feels so I know that I'm lost in these worlds and these beings see me lost in these worlds and I see other people lost in the physical world or sometimes they get involved in the etheric world you know some side side shamanic type of practices and then they think they've got something and you just see them lost in the physical etheric world does it ever feel overwhelming or scary knowing more than what most people know no because uh, most people uh, which when you say most people you mean the people in the physical bodies but there's far more beings out of the body than there are in the body so <laughs> if you become aware of the inner worlds you become aware of far more beings and um, who are, don't know more than I know, they, sorry, don't know less than I know, they know as much or more. So um, you're part of a much bigger system and uh, so you don't really, the, the few that are still on the physical level, uh, you, you don't feel like you're one of a few, you, you feel in fact like you're one of many. Yeah, and the few are the ones still lost on the body, lost in the body. So you've talked about mm. making a lot of these teachings available to the people that make an effort, as opposed to some of your old teachers who thought about inner schools or like taught wrong information publicly on purpose and kept these kind of um, secrets just for these inner schools. I feel like you have a lot of confidence in your students to openly share these uh, practices with us who make an effort. So first of all, thank you. But second of all, I'm, I'm almost a little nervous about that because I feel like people can make a video of you doing something and put that out there and then other people, be, when we're gone, people are gonna see that video and say, this is the way he practiced. I mean, do you worry about um, the, the length of your teachings? Like when you leave, this body, are you concerned about what's going to happen to what you're teaching now? You know, there's three stages in learning usually, and one is when you're just learning for yourself, and one is when you're teaching other people, and then the third one is when you're um, contributing to the continuance of the teaching, because the teaching needs to continue. And so usually as people are getting older in the teaching, that becomes their main concern, how the teaching will continue, because if suddenly everybody here stopped practicing, everything I taught would disappear out of the physical world and be lost. And so it, it needs a certain structure to continue, um, but it's not all up to a person like myself. There's things being managed from a much higher level. So, so the teaching that I give out um, is, is managed by the um, an array of beings who are involved in that teaching and so it's not just me that's giving out the teaching um, I do my best and I need to make sure that the teaching will somehow continue in its best form because some teachings die away and others grow the essential um, thing of whether the teaching grows or not is what support it's receiving from the inner levels so if I make something up out of my head, some brilliant teaching, and I you know, add, add a bit of science and a bit of this and a bit of that, and I teach it, there's no particular support from the inner levels. Um, when I'm gone, it will be gone, guaranteed. These things just fade away. You see it all the time. A lot of students, big teaching, it's gone. Something like Buddhism 
two and a half thousand years old, and it's as strong now as it ever was. Because actually the Buddha and an array of beings stand behind it. And it was a, a very good teaching that's put out. There's no, you know, it's lacking in the violence, it's lacking in the trying to push it on other people and so on. So it's a very pure teaching and it's still supported. And it's, I've just been living in Thailand for a while and it's very, very strong there. The, the Thai people are Buddhists, they really believe in it and they respect the Buddha and the Buddha's teaching. So whether a teaching lives or dies is partially due to someone like myself, but in a very small way. The big thing behind it is the, whether the, um, it's supported from the inner levels or not. So does that mean for those of us that are teaching, as long as we have a good motive um, and practice, then those forces are also supporting us? And that's absolutely right, yeah. And you're in co you, you come in contact with those forces through your teacher. So it's something that we don't really say much in the West, but in India they understand it, that something flows through from the teaching. They sometimes say, you know, there's a, one third comes from God, one third comes from the, this is the Indian. One third from your teacher and one from the teaching itself. Um, that's, that's a reasonable idea. Actually something, your connection with this array of support comes through your, your teacher until you're at a level where you can receive it directly, if you reach that level, and then it will come through you to your students. Mm -hmm. So the, um, if you don't have a developed teacher, a somewhat developed teacher, um, managing a teaching, it will it will not succeed because they can't transmit the, even if there's an inner, inner something behind it, um, they may not be able to transmit enough of that. What's needed for a person's inner growth. So we don't no normally talk about that in the West because it may lead to the teacher then being re looked at as some sort of God figure or you don't have to do much, I'm just going to put out my energy and you're going to be ev evolved. All these types of uh, mis misuses of that. So it's better to hardly even know about it. But it's something that happens very strongly and makes the difference whether it's just a, a mixture of people with some practices or whether it's a, something really happening. There's a lot going on in this world and mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot to understand and know. Um, so I just want to say thank you for joining us again for this interview. You have so much more to share. Um, so I hope that we can do it again. Yeah.